my thanks to Bring Me to Life Radio, and welcome to the Cinema Scribe. At some point in our lives, many of us come face to face with situations where we need to make difficult choices and engage in challenging tasks, simply because they're the right thing to do. Such efforts may test us severely, pushing us to the brink of, and possibly beyond, what we think we're capable of. Those can be hard times for sure, but when we consider what's at stake and what we can gain by willingly choosing to act, we're likely to see what we must do if we're to live with ourselves. So it is for the beleaguered protagonists in two new fact-based releases, Dark Waters and Bombshell. In Dark Waters, attorney Rob Ballot, played by Mark Ruffalo, enjoys a comfortable and successful life as a corporate attorney in Cincinnati. He's made a good career for himself representing companies in the chemical industry, most notably DuPont, one of his firm's most important clients. In fact, his legal defense work for that organization contributed significantly to him making partner and becoming one of the most trusted advisors to managing partner Tom Turp, played by Tim Robbins. And, outside of work, Rob is happily married to his wife Sarah, played by Anne Hathaway, who gave up her career as a lawyer to become a stay-at-home mother of three. It seems like everything is going his way. That is, until someone walks into his office one day and changes his life forever. While conferring with his fellow partners, Rob is called out of the meeting when he's asked for by name by someone he's never met, West Virginia farmer Wilbur Tennant, played by Bill Camp. Utterly perplexed, Rob asks Wilbur why he specifically wants to see him, to which the stranger replies that he was recommended by one of Rob's relatives from back home in Parkersburg, West Virginia, where the attorney spent many of his summers while growing up. When Rob then inquires about the nature of Wilbur's legal needs, the farmer tells him that contaminants had seeped onto his property and poisoned the drinking water source for his herd of cows, killing 190 of them. Wilbur then points the finger at the culprit he believes is behind the problem, the DuPont organization. Rob tells Wilbur that, since he represents DuPont, it's unlikely that he'll be able to help him. But something about Wilbur's story troubles him, so Rob drives to Parkersburg to investigate further. Upon witnessing the harm inflicted on Wilbur's farm, he feels compelled to see if there's any way he can help. And so, upon returning to Cincinnati, he consults with his peers to discuss a way to work out the situation between Wilbur and DuPont. Rob approaches DuPont executive Phil Donnelly, played by Victor Garber, to negotiate a settlement arrangement, and the company initially agrees to cooperate. But before long, matters take a left turn, and the deal is off. As Rob begins to discover more of what's really going on in Parkersburg, he sees a bigger problem than just the deaths of Wilbur's cows. He wants to help those who have been hurt, but he's also got his obligations to his firm, and to DuPont as a client. But after an anxious discussion with Tom, he persuades the managing partner to back him in his plan to take on the chemical company giant, despite the stakes involved. Challenging one of the country's largest and most beloved companies quickly proves to be a much bigger undertaking than anticipated. Rob becomes buried in piles of discovery material submitted in hopes that the sheer volume will discourage him in his quest. But he's not the only one taken to task. Wilbur comes under fire, too, as Parkersburg residents shun the man who has decided to threaten the community's largest employer and the livelihood of its many workers, most of whom would be lost without their jobs at DuPont. Despite those obstacles, though, Rob meticulously reviews the discovery materials, and Wilbur sticks to his guns to proceed, public reaction notwithstanding. Circumstances quickly escalate for all concerned. The long hours involved in reviewing the discovery materials take a toll on Rob's physical and emotional well-being, as well as the health of his marriage. But when Rob meets with a chemical expert, played by John Newberg, he learns what's behind the pollution, and he's shocked. 
He discovers that the drinking water has been contaminated with substances known as forever chemicals, those that don't break down in the body and accumulate over time. What's more, they've amassed to such an extent that much of the Parkersburg community, and perhaps even users of product containing these chemicals outside of the area, could well be affected. Thus begins a protracted legal battle. DuPont offers to settle with Wilbur a proposal that Rob encourages him to accept. But he refuses, contending that he wants justice more than money, especially in light of the wide-ranging health implications. With huge volumes of sludge containing the toxic chemicals dumped upriver from Wilbur's farm, it's not hard to see how his cows became sick, or how Wilbur and his wife Sandra, played by Denise Talvara, subsequently followed suit. It was enough to keep Rob fighting. A comparable form of outrage rears its head in Bombshell. Over the course of two decades, television executive Roger Ailes, played by John Lithgow, built the Fox News Channel into cable TV's most successful news outlet. By 2016, Ailes helped to make it the most profitable property of its parent media organization, News Corp, much to the delight of the conglomerate CEO, Rupert Murdoch, played by Malcolm McDowell. And he did it by targeting a particular underserved audience, one closely resembling his own sensibilities, and then getting the most out of his fanatically loyal, though some might say rigidly coerced, team of employees. Regardless of what one might have thought about the channel's politics, policies, practices, and pundits, Fox News was undoubtedly a success story and an immense cash cow. So what was that underserved audience that Ailes recorded? It was the conservative right wing of the American political landscape, a constituency that was mostly white, male, and traditional in its prevailing outlooks. Ailes skillfully amassed a staff of on-air talent and producers who knew how to appeal to that audience. And to secure the loyalty of the network's core viewers, Ailes assembled a team of beautiful, leggy, female anchors and correspondents, a veritable palette of stunningly gorgeous, mostly blonde eye candy, sure to appeal to those who liked a little voyeurism with their news. Critics of this approach to team building were quick to call it sexist, accusations that Ailes handily brushed aside by glibly observing that, quote, television is a visual medium, unquote. Regardless of Ailes' tactics, one couldn't deny his success. Some might even say that his tightly focused, specifically targeted plan for reaching his core audience was brilliant, effectively tapping into and capturing the attention of the viewership he was seeking to land. However, considering the specific practices that Ailes used in achieving his goals, especially where recruiting on-air talent was concerned, any praise he might have received was instantly called into question. The reason? Ailes assembled much of his team through sexual innuendo and coercion, swapping career opportunities and promotions for favors extended through leering looks, salacious comments, and bald-faced propositions for acts of sexual submission. Despite his professed claims in support of journalistic integrity and broadcast professionalism, the cheesecake factor frequently figured into his plans. And with the ever-looming threat of retaliation or dismissal for non-compliance or disloyalty hanging in the balance, those who didn't bow to Roger's wishes could face serious consequences if they didn't play ball. However, over time, word of Ailes' sexual harassment began leaking through the organization. Previously silent employees began tentatively speaking to one another, comparing notes about their own experiences or sharing stories that they had heard about peers. An organization long kept in line by its head's unbridled manipulative practices was at last beginning to crack. Bombshell tells this story through the personal experiences of three Fox staffers. Megan Kelly, played by Charlize Theron, one of the channel's biggest honor assets, who had been harassed at one time, but who was reluctant to step forward to publicly criticize her boss years after the fact, given the successful career she had built for herself. Gretchen Carlson, played by Nicole Kidman, 
a one-time Fox success story who had been systematically demoted for her divergent on-air views and her resistance to Ailes advances, some of which she secretly recorded without his knowledge. And Kayla Pospisil, played by Margot Robbie, a composite fictional character said to be based on several Fox employees whose enthusiasm to move up through the ranks soon brought her face to face with the way things really worked in Rogers' organization. Through their interwoven stories and the characters' ongoing interactions with Ailes, viewers see how the organization's dirty little secret mushroomed into a major scandal that brought swift action at Fox News and increased public attention to the issue of sexual harassment in the workplace. When faced with the kinds of difficulties present in these two films, those affected face some hard choices. Do they blow the whistle on those using their power to try and control their destinies? Or do they keep quiet to preserve their status? With so much on the line, decisions didn't come easily. Outsiders, for instance, might have easily said, and rightly so, that no self-respecting individual should have to put up with the kind of abuse to which they were subjected. However, when faced with the loss of one's livelihood and expensive legal bills, victims had to think twice about making waves. The outcomes obtained by these courageous crusaders in both films reflect their resolve to live out their destiny. Despite the difficulties they may have experienced along the way, the efforts they expended to achieve change were worth it in the end. It was ultimately their calling to do what they did, and fortunately they rose to the occasion, coming up with the means, both individually and collectively, to achieve the results they sought. Stories like these outrage most of us who hear about them. One wonders how any individual or organization, in all good conscience, could allow circumstances like these to go on for as long as they did. It raises serious questions about priorities. However, both of these films illustrate the virtues of heroism and doing the right thing. They set powerful examples for all of us to follow when we realize what must be done to set things right. Fortunately for all of us, there are courageous souls out there who are willing to step up and challenge the guilty parties. And thankfully, their fearless, intrepid efforts can prove to be effective enough to achieve justice for everyone. I'm Brent Marchant, The Cinema Scribe. Thanks for listening. A lifelong movie fan and a longtime student of metaphysics, Cinema Scribe Brent Marchant is the award winning author of Get the Picture Conscious Creation Goes to the Movies, Consciously Created Cinema, The Movie Lover's Guide to the Law of Attraction, and Third Real Conscious Creation Goes Back to the Movies, all of which provide reader friendly looks at how the practice of conscious creation, also known as the Law of Attraction, is illustrated through film. Brett maintains an ongoing blog about metaphysical cinema and other self-empowerment topics through his website, www.brentmarchant.com. He's also the movie correspondent for the Good Radio Network and New Consciousness Review Magazine and Radio, with additional writing contributions to Smart Women's Empowerment, The Happy Guide, Library Journal, Belief Net, Vivid Life, New Age News, and Master Heart Magazine. Brett holds a BA in Magazine Journalism and History from Syracuse University. Again, check him out at www.brentmarshop.com.